So thanks, uh, Philip, for the introduction. Um, yes. um, so I, I, I think it's it's quite in line um, uh, what has been discussed um, uh, um, before. So keep uh, in mind that um, standards are, are not there for for technical um, purposes, but standards are there uh, to actually enable markets, which would not be possible without these standards. So I think it's it's fair to to look at um, how actually um, are these standards now enable markets out there, which would not be possible without. And with that perspective, I would like to to look again in the next slides on something Jens uh, introduced on the technical side uh, and actually make sure that, um, of course, with this uh, step model, which is intensively discussed within within Chain, there are different actually stakeholders then interacting with this um, step model. Of course, it's the standardization and also all the testing we need to do to ensure interoperability. But looking at the different phases of CCS um, from basic, as it's uh, already now used quite a while today, to CCS extended, as uh, Jens explained, uh, now uh, are entering the market. And uh, CCS advanced, probably still out there for one to two years. Um, we have also to look at how actually the other stakeholders, like those uh, dealing with the products, and actually creating, uh, based on the standard, uh, the enable market um, interact with it. And so I would like to, to really now take a look from this commercial uh, point of view onto uh, the 1511.8 activities. So what is the value of EV charging? In the next slide, I would it reflects uh, most of the answers uh, we today get. Yeah, it's um, coming from a world where you are fueling cars. Uh, people think of it, it's really about this, this um, power transfer. Yeah? It's like, like uh, the fuel flow, uh, of course, here. And when it comes to charging, it's about the electric power you are transferring. So it's something about these two, three, four euro thing, what you are transferring to, to the vehicle. Um, but really think about, so if you, if you ask now the different uh, participants, and for instance, as a stakeholder, the retailer like IKEA, they won't answer you, it's, it's about these two euros. They would answer you, it's about 20 minutes, a customer stays local. And that's interesting. So it's more about, um, how you actually integrate charging, because the difference between fueling and charging is not only that you are changing how the energy is transported, but actually you are changing how you can do uh, and how you integrate charging. So it's um, like in the past when we looked at that the supermarket uh, got to the fuel stations. Nowadays with, with charging, it's the opposite way around, right? So the charging gets to the retailer, so to the business out there. And actually, you can take a look at this from the different verticals. So on the next slide, there's just a, a list of, of different verticals. So whether that's the retailer, the fleet operator, the coffee shop, you name it of daily business. And you can always think, hey, what is actually electric mobility brings to that business? And then you detect why that, that looks like um, that that this EV charging, if you integrate it really into the business as a part of the business process, there's a lot more revenue to leverage than only the power transfer. And so it's really like, to some extent, a shift in, in behavior we know from these devices. Yeah? And 20 years ago, it was because we came from the cable telephone, it was phoning with these devices. But um, more and more we understood what you can do else if this is a more smarter, a more component which is integrated in business process, how you actually can drive revenue. And we see now this break 
actually in the market also with with EV charging. So if you ask who is and where uh, people charge, um, they are charging where it's convenient. It's like with a notebook when there's a cable you plug in. And so this brings us to a different actually um, view on this step model. So it's more the question what uh, do we enable in the business process integration with the standard technologies? And of course, there's the, the, the very basic ground is the technical feature. But now think of how do you integrate it in a certain application so that you enable this business process and therefore also the revenue flow we see here. And this is to make it clear this is no longer the, the role of a standard to do this, but this is, of course, those creating products based on the standard to make this happen. But the standard itself is kind of the enabler that this is at all possible. Yeah. So if we look now in the next slide again on the step model, we can change the perspective and think of, based on these steps, what kind of products actually can we create which would not be possible before having you know, these features in the standards. But what we are then create is no longer only the technical um, feature of the standard, but actually the, the, the business process integration. Yeah? So you can now um, start, and uh, you, uh, this already actually started with CCS Basic, you can do things like on-site power management. Yeah, We know that in the past, even with ACs charging with this virtual power plant energy management things, but now you even can do that close to a real-time thing uh, as an on-site power management, especially with fleets. Yeah. So if you think of city logistics, e-buses, and so on, um, this becomes possible. Um, of course, now with the, with the information exchange over the standard interface, the identifications, but also uh, with plug and charge, you can create your own integration in your own app. Yeah. So what we, for instance, do together with retailers is to look at how can we make an now charging part, uh, part of an end-of-end -end customer journey so that the customer not has you know to pay during the journey three, four, five times, but actually it's completely integrated. It's not paying for, for the charging as such, but integrated in a in a customer reward program. So it's easy to, to do that. And still the basics are those features in CCS Basic and CCX Extended, without it would not be possible to do this, this uh, business process integration. And of course, with things which are now out there with CCS Extended, so that you can, for instance, do value add services, you can even think of integrating charging into fleet management, including preconditioning as we use it for e-buses or into dispositioning systems where it's clear how you manage a whole load of more or more than uh, two or three gigawatts of, of, of charging power in the right way so that the vehicles are available for the right distance at the right time. And there are other candidates uh, with those advanced um, uh, CCS features coming up. Uh, so think of um, what has been already touched with bidirectional charging, what this means with home energy management systems or with the ACD systems, the auto connection device systems, that you even increase the time vehicles are connected because it's kind of these always connected features. And again, this then will become part of an of a product solution particular companies will work on. Now the question is how, how you actually implement the features. And they are coming from a quite traditional industry. Uh, we see still a lot who who start you know to say okay if I want now to build on a certain CCS feature uh, my application I somehow to have in hand the complete implementation um, and then in the next slide I typically ask one question to these colleagues would you re-implement the internet protocol actually in my professional life I have never met in the past five years someone who implemented an internet protocol. And that's also part of this uh, standard way and the professionalized market. Yes, in the beginning, you have to do it because there are no implementations. But at a certain point in time, based on standard, 
enabling a professional market means also, and you have seen this modularity of uh, what has been standardized in CCS, and I think this is really a key differentiator to other standards out there, uh, the clear orientation of the ISO layers, the modularity, so that you can use the CCS ecosystem, as pointed out in the next slide. And, and this means, basically, you are not implementing from scratch. You are, would not implement an internet protocol, but you just take uh, um, uh, available implementation. If that's based on Linux, based on Windows, based on even commercial stuff for a dedicated embedded platform, but there are partners out there providing this and also providing uh, the expertise on this. So this means basically when we now think of how to integrate charging into business processes, there, I would say, are two core fields where to do that. That's on one hand side on the charger in the field, and the other side is on the back end side. Um, and um, um, here to, to integrate in classical cloud, uh, cloud systems. But we see that on both sides, basically. So think of, again, the power management on site. Uh, there you have timings which would not allow to do that in the back end. So that's a typical example where you do that in the field. We also see this due to reliability that you do some integrations, for instance, for authentication in the field, just to avoid that there are hiccups uh, with um, um, back end connectivity. Now, if you think of these two, two uh, directions, so how do I integrate in the field and how do I integrate in, 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 um, in the back end? The question is, how does this CCS ecosystem uh, looks like? And I believe that's quite also part of the uh, professional system. So we can take a look uh, at the next slide. And um, I'm pretty sure this is not uh, something untypical, but quite a typical approach. So um, um, there are partners either providing stacks or providing a complete um, operating system as, as EcoG is doing. And um, these partners then uh, provide systems which are ready to use um, to actually focus on these revenue driving applications and features and not to re-implement the wheel again, um, meaning the pure CCS or charging uh, functionality. Uh, that would mean like, like Apple still, you know, spending 10% of their uh, uh, R&D budget on implementing an audio codec. That just simply does not make sense. It's not a customer differentiating feature. So, um, it's it's really to look, make use of the CCS ecosystem and then focusing on actually what makes uh, the charging with respect to the integration uh, different. And for that, um, I think whether that's a stack, whether that's an operating system, um, due to the nicely organization of um, these layered approach in the standard, it's quite straightforward to provide uh, open APIs so that you can implement on uh, on top or on that particular layer the functionality you see with your charger and your um, uh, business uh, driving features um, to provide to the market. And of course, we also as a company provide such a starter kit which enables to to start with actually a working CCS uh, DC charger and to really focus on what are the features I want to put on, on onto this charger. But you can also take one of the components and I'm pretty sure the, um, um, the CCS ecosystem will provide several solutions in the market, uh, which are already today available, you can choose one. And you can then take a similar look actually on the backend side. There, it's uh, basically the same story. So if you go to the next slide, also there, um, you are not needing to, to, to start from scratch. So what we see, of course, business integration means you need to have multiple interfaces as you do today with these kind of devices um, to the different uh, stakeholders uh, who want to integrate it into their um, business processes. And again, here, I'm pretty sure there are uh, several suppliers in the market uh, providing starter kits like we do, so that basically you just uh, integrate uh, and start to implement your, your business process integration based on these APIs provided. 
and you even don't need a you know a complete charger just the uh, setup of a starter kit is sufficient to provide actually your own products then um, taking and making use out of uh, the CCS standard implementing uh, the business process integration so the typical IT cloud-based integrations to make uh, dedicated um, applications happen like integration in a customer reward program like a, a, a virtual power plant in in the perspective of a, of a grid operator um, or even integrate charging as part of the building and no longer as a a standalone uh, device which might even optimize your capex situation and this approach of course as we know it with modern technology is even enabling a parallel development which is i think quite uh, important uh, as of today in a remote fashion uh, so you can do that from your remote uh, office from home because it's it's this kind of modularity that you can um, actually emulate a complete uh, a DC charger based on standard technologies. So for these kind of business process uh, integration implementations, you no longer need a real charger. It's sufficient to take, you know, that components of, of the standards in your on your desk and then um, um, start uh, and verify uh, your your implementations. Okay, so hopefully I could uh, give you an idea about why standards are important now, not only to look at the technology, but also to understand and think about what are actually those standards enabling, what kind of revenue, what kind of markets um, are is CCS now opening up, uh, which is maybe a little bit thinking around the corner if you come from traditional supply business in the in in in, in the vehicle space in uh, in the fuel case uh, so this is what we ch see changing in electric mobility so next slide thank you very much and uh, looking forward to discuss this thank you very much um, different insights um, very comprehensive I'm, I'm my takeaway from this presentation is indeed that uh, yeah, future reliability is in, indeed very important and also the implementation possibilities for all the other applications. Um, I would not have to think about it in the first place, but um, I think it's certainly worth it. Um, we take the questions um, at the Q&A at the end and we'll go first to our next speaker, Dirk. Um, are you ready? to take over? Yes, uh, thanks, Philip. Please. Um, OK, so welcome to the last part of this presentation session. And um, we're going back to the standard and how the, the ISO standard is evolving. And this is kind of <laughs> what we've done here is trying to put the cart before the horses, uh, I guess. Uh, so this is where it all comes from, if we look at the, the, the standard. And um, so um, if we look on the next slide, uh, what I've brought here today to the table is looking again at the generation one, uh, ISO 15118, and then also uh, what's next with the generation two. So let's right away dig into um, gen one on the next slide, please. So we have we have heard that several times um, today. Um, what is really the content, the technical content of the the specification? Um, because this is uh, the, the root, yeah, of all the implementation we are doing and everything we're discussing here. Whether it is on a technical level, whether it's on a business level, everything comes from the root, and the root is uh, the specification here. So at the moment we have different energy transfer types for AC uh, and DC charging, um, various power levels uh, also possible. We have this identification means with external, so for example, RFID card, if you've heard, but also the plug and charge use case with a uh, certificate-based approach here, which is really unique uh, to this kind of uh, technology and that makes uh, ISO so special. Uh, and this is something I think no other standard offers today, the capability of doing this. 
Um, and uh, yeah, so I really would like to outline this is the unique, one of the unique features uh, of the standard. Um, secondly, if we look at the smart charging, yeah, it's all about the power schedule and the sales tariff. Um, also, this is uh, something really unique that this is defined within the standard that you are able to negotiate power schedule and uh, make certain selections uh, on, on vehicle side and also on charging station side. And um, uh, last aspect here, I think it's also the security approach that especially if we using plug and charge, <coughs> um, then TLS, transport layer security is mandatory here um, as a security uh, feature. Um, again, from the safety side, that's all part of the IEC uh, standard. And then also parts of what uh, Jörg already mentioned with this preconditioning, for example, for commercial vehicles, this can be handled then via the value added uh, services. So this is the scope of this generation one, uh, already uh, uh, a huge asset here. And if you're looking at the next uh, slide, um, um, yeah, the documents um, that are describing these features, these standards, um, they are available uh, since a couple of years. Um, as Jens already mentioned at the beginning, they are split in different uh, documents. The dash one is the general document um, describing the use cases. The dash two document is all about, let's say, the software protocol part, the network and application uh, layer. And the dash three document is the physical layer. Uh, in our case, it's a PLC, power line communication um, technology that we are using here. And then uh, again, we have the dash four and the five document that are describing the conformance tests. And um, you can all uh, get them, you can all buy them uh, in the internet. For example, we have the Boyd uh, link uh, I put in here. So let's go to the next slide. And uh, therefore, and again, the next, let's look at the next generation. So what's uh, ahead of us? Um, next slide, please. So let's look at the next generation um, of ISO 1511.8. Uh, what are we targeting here? Um, so we are looking at new energy modes. So um, one aspect is the bi-directional power transfer. So that means also we're trying to feedback energy from the vehicle into the grid. Um, a feature that's currently uh, missing, and I'll elaborate on that uh, later on a little more. Uh, second part is the wireless power transfer. That means basically inductive charging. And the third uh, aspect is the automatic connecting devices. Um, I'll also uh, elaborate later. Uh, secondly, we have some improvements um, uh, on the general level, uh, so to say. Um, on one hand side, we have a, a scheduled and dynamic mode, um, also explained later why we need that. Uh, secondly, we have a new physical layer, especially for uh, wireless uh, power transfer. If we have no direct connection to the car, we also need a different physical layer for the communication channel because, as I said, there's no physical link. So therefore, uh, we introduced uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, for that part. And uh, last not least, the security part. So uh, TLS now is mandatory for all um, parts and there's no exception uh, possible anymore. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, I would like to elaborate a little more on the different uh, Energy flows are, uh, first of all, uh, bi-directional um, power transfer. Um, obviously, uh, I think the feature could be clear. One side, one side it could be the, the balancing of the grid. If there are either a local uh, grid or a more uh, global part, 
as well if there is a huge amount of vehicles that we can shift energy um, obviously we have to consider also maybe the, the frequency control uh, on the grid um, but I think uh, even what's more important and that's really where the, the, the feature request uh, comes from is also for uh, let's call it uh, self-sufficient homes or island mode as it's called so um, this is really uh, gives you the possibility to act as a buffer for a local storage so to say also in case of uh, emergencies let's say i don't know earthquakes uh, fires uh, whatever when the grid um, is out of uh, control so to say um, you're still able to operate your home or your local appliances uh, by means of your vehicle storage uh, part um, could give you a good um, uh, feeling here and a good asset for your um, vehicle here um, as I said, uh, if we want uh, to use this, we need a new way of negotiating um, the, the energy management, and therefore we introduced this dynamic mode, uh, which is uh, really essential for the bidirectional power transfer, so that the infrastructure part can really control um, the charging process in this way, and um, um, waits for the reaction of the vehicle in this case. So let's go to the uh, next slide, please. Um, second part was the wireless power transfer. Um, so as I said, this is uh, inductive charging and um, for the communication part, obviously we have to rely on also on some electrical um, prerequisites. Um, they are defined in the IC uh, 61980. Um, we have also to make sure um, that we are putting the vehicle on the right uh, ground pad so that the positioning works and if the vehicle is uh, parked there that also the uh, pairing process um, between the devices, the ground pad and the vehicle um, works properly and that you're not talking to a neighborhood uh, Wi-Fi uh, access point or whatsoever and then all of a sudden this one uh, goes off and you're not charging. So these are really some technical uh, aspects we have to solve here and that's why I marked them uh, red. So these are at the moment, at least from standardization part, the most critical uh, aspects I see that we have to solve them in the standardization uh, process. Um, to make this uh, a solid uh, standard. Um, obviously, the, the, the key advantages with uh, wireless power transfer are, are fairly obvious. Um, it's a real convenience feature for the driver. If you're just uh, parking your car, um, you don't have to think about then um, Where's my cable? Uh, yeah, how do I have it to plug it in? Oh, it's raining, uh, and, and so on. Um, you're just driving over the ground pad. Um, real convenient. Um, obviously, one aspect here is you don't want to wipe an RFID card for, for uh, inductive charging. So things like plug and charge are really uh, key features um, if you want to do that. Obviously, um, we can think about various type of usage. So as the one I described uh, right now was basically the static parking in the parking lot, but this could also be used, if we think really ahead of us, what's uh, possible um, with smart cities and things like that, um, charging at the driving light or the, a taxi stand, or even if we have a built-in um, system in the road. This could also be uh, while driving. So technical possible if this is really a business case uh, we have to see. So this is uh, the background on the wireless power transfer and then let's go to the next slide please. 
Um, so the last aspect I mentioned uh, is the automatic connecting device. So as you see in the pictures here, this could be uh, either used for pantograph uh, charging of buses or commercial vehicles where the regular uh, cable and uh, physical possibilities that the cable offers is too low, too limited. Um, so uh, with this kind of pantographs, uh, you can go up to um, higher power classes, um, as mentioned here. Um, nevertheless, what you also have to uh, ensure is that the pairing and positioning works properly. So um, the pantograph is only uh, operated when the bus is parked and at the right uh, position. And again, uh, the pairing that you're really talking to the right uh, pole in this case. Um, so it's also this marked red here because this is uh, again um, the most critical discussion we right now have in, in, in standardization. Um, as I said, this is the first thing we just uh, came to our mind when we discussed this automatic connecting device, but it also goes on that uh, one could think about, uh, if we're th thinking about uh, autonomous vehicles, autonomous electric vehicles, we might also have to have something like uh, automatic uh, charging for these kind of passenger cars and uh, therefore also for passenger cars uh, automatic charging might be an aspect and this could be also be handled by means um, of this uh, aspects provided by the protocol here. So let's go to the next slide. Um, again, so how far is the standardization? As I outlined uh, previously, we have the different types of documents, the dash one document with the use cases, and also incorporating this, let's say, next generation type that's already available since, thousand, uh, since 2019. Um, we are currently working on the preparation of the final draft uh, for the dash 20 document. So the dash 20 document is really the um, update document, uh, the new version of the um, ISO incorporating these features I just uh, mentioned. Um, target date um, is 2021, um, so next year. Um, as mentioned, what we need uh, for some use cases is the wireless communication. Um, this is specified in the Dash 8 document. Um, so um, an update of this has been provided this year. So this is already available uh, today. And um, also uh, what we are currently doing um, is already discussing the conformance tests. We started um, with the Dash 9, basically providing the conformance test for the physical layer. And later we we have, after we have finalized the Dash 20 document, we will then also start with conformance tests uh, for the Dash 20 um, document. Um, so next slide, please. Um, yeah, so this is the end of my presentation. I hope I was able to give you a short introduction um, on the standardization efforts we are taking right now and where we are and what the next steps are. And maybe I could uh, catch up with some time. And uh, this gives us now the possibility for the, the panel sessions, um, or maybe there are already questions uh, right away. Um, I don't know. Thank you, Dirk. Um... Thank you for your insights from your point of view. It's indeed very good to know that um, besides already the known factors in the, in the charging, bidirectional, etc., but it is also handling um, wireless power transfer and also the, um, the automatic connection. That's um, very good to, to see. So I would like to invite the other speakers also to be present and go to the to the questions that comes in from from the audience. 
Um, when can we expect confirmant tests for uh, 15, 118, 20? In the meanwhile, how can we implement some functions of, of it, um, such as BPT? Yeah, as I said, the, the, the prerequisite for, I think the prerequisite for the conformance test is uh, that, that we have the standard and the requirements in place. And uh, uh, I think that's is really the, the way we should go. First, we have to have the requirements within the Dash 20 document. And when this is uh, finished, we can then uh, start looking at the conformance test and what has to be tested uh, without the requirements uh, seems to be useless i think yeah, and this is i think the the way we have decided in the iso working group that we will uh, proceed uh, and then it depends on um, in detail how we handle the approach i think jens already mentioned uh, that earlier um, that it's what we discussed so far is uh, the possibility to split up the conformance test document in uh, maybe different use cases, so to say that, that we can really separate, for example, maybe the uh, conformance test for the bidirectional power transfer and uh, handle that first, or yeah, uh, and then later on um, inductive charging and uh, ACD. Um, so that we don't have to wait until everything is finished, but we can split it up into individual pieces and uh, be a little faster um, from the specification mm. side. Okay, we have a direct yeah, so maybe to add to add on this. So, um, yeah. yeah, the common common milestone you normally refer to would be the, the XML schema that is required uh, from the ISO 15008 uh, standpoint, basically because this is the common denominator we need before we can really start to, to implement um, corresponding test cases. However, of course, and that is exactly what we are doing, uh, we are right now already thinking about the structure and how the outline, as Dirk just mentioned, is for the, for the new uh, Dash 20 conformance tests. Due to the enormous number of features, options, and uh, also use cases for charging, we have to figure out a way how we can split it up uh, because we do not want to provide one major block of conformance test document at the end and then you just refer to that document and by referring to that document you are basically referring to nothing because it's or to the entire scope because it's really too too broad and for that reason we are we are really want we want to uh, split it up and uh, how we do this exactly is not yet defined uh, mm -hmm. for good reason because the dash 20 is not yet finalized and I, as i understand there is lots of discussion at the moment going on because some features are a little bit more mature than others in the specification and that uh, is currently being being um, discussed how to handle that and for that reason i think it's a wise decision to wait step right. back of course on the other side there is definitely some prototype implementations available and testing vendors are preparing, of course, to, to, to provide uh, some uh, development supporting tools. So, um, yeah, if that's basically because that was the second part of the question. So there is definitely some means available to kind of kickstart the development. However, it needs to be uh, known that currently it's not yet um, the definite and last stable state of the, of the protocol. It will still evolve a little bit more over time. Yeah, and, and Jens, I think uh, just uh, two words on that. It's not only about, you know, waiting for this conformance test, but also about contributing actually to it. So if you are, you know, testing uh, your prototype implementation and so on and do the first evaluation, then also uh, collect some of the findings because that's uh, increasing the quality also of the conformance test. So contributing then to this effort so don't see that only one way, but also contributing is, I think, quite quite important. Fully agree, yeah. Good, then we can go to the next question, which actually is directly um, towards Jens. Um, does Fersico also implement the test themselves or only design and provide the testing tools and process? 
<laughs> yeah, we are we are uh, the test cases and uh, the test suites are implemented in house. It's uh, our own implementation. Um, it's built on top of a conformance test automation framework based on TTCN3, um, which we kind of um, transfer to that CC to the CCS domain. Uh, TTCN3 is coming from the from the telco industry. Has proven, um, yeah good modularity and adaptability to very different application scenarios um, was or it, it is still used in the telco industry for performance testing of um, 4G, 5G communication stacks uh, where interoperability uh, is also a major, major topic and what we did within Verisco is basically that we um, um, transferred that technology to the CCS domain um, integrating um, uh, power, uh, um, power um, transport support as well as signaling support uh, with corresponding test adapters um, and combine it in, in one automated test, uh, test framework with the test cases according to the standards uh, implemented inside the corresponding test suites. Thank you. Um, yeah, question that also pops up um, from my side actually. Um, the ISO norm that we have discussed now, but is it also developed to guarantee compat compatibility with other standards like CHAdeMO? Mm. <laughs> just, just, just from a technical uh, level, um, it's not possible because if you look at the right uh, way from the physical layer, yeah, so Chademo and uh, Chao Chi or uh, GPT standard is based on CAN uh, communication. And uh, we are using TCP IP uh, based communication over uh, power line or Wi Fi. So these are just on the physical layer, there's no real match uh, there. Um, I know that uh, obviously now uh, Chademo and GPT are talking about the joint uh, Chao Chi uh, standard there. So this is the first kind of unification uh, process. And I think what's, uh, as I understood the Chao Chi roadmap, um, they are also uh, having TCP IP based communication on the roadmap. So, and if we have an alignment uh, on this level, then we can also, uh, I think, discuss uh, it on the on the protocol or on a network protocol level. Yeah, but without the the physical interoperability, uh, I think that's uh, uh, technically uh, almost impossible. Yeah, that's a very clear answer, um, which is could have. Uh, Handled anyway. Um, on certificate creation, deployment and management is uh, not something clarified in the standards. Um, are there any plans to standardize it in 20s or leave it to each um, MO vehicle to grid route and OEM? So maybe just one answer from my side, I think then Christian can uh, jump in. Um, yeah. So uh, because this has always been, I think, a uh, discussion or uh, complaints about the, the ISO standard, yes? And uh, I always like to make clear what is the focus on the ISO standard. The focus on the ISO standard is not about specifying a complete public key infrastructure uh, area. That, that is not the scope, yeah? The scope is to provide a mechanism that the infrastructure side and the vehicle are able to talk to each other on a unified agreed protocol and that it's clear who is sending which information in which order and th this is understood properly and that is then handled uh, also accordingly and that the appropriate response is uh, then provided to uh, the request. And what we are using is a technology um, that is 
known in other industries, yes, with a, let's say, central um, root authority, with central, uh, as Christian described, uh, root certificate as a trust anchor, yeah? and uh, the transport protocol, so to say, the transport of this kind of certificates, this is in scope of the ISO, but how you create those certificates, how you create uh, this chain of uh, certificates, that's not the part of the standard anymore because this is described in other uh, documents typically, how you create um, such a root certificate, how uh, you uh, use uh, contract certificates um, and things like that. So that's my perspective from the uh, standardization uh, point of view and how that should be applied, but maybe Christian has some more. Yeah, words yeah thank you, Dirk. Well, I can only agree and I just want to highlight what you have just stated, that by relying on, on, on already techno technology which is being used in other use cases since a long time, I think that's one of the, of the uh, great things about the ISO 15108 standards. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We can use what is already there and using certificates is something we are doing in a lot of other activities on a daily basis. Um, and we just, as you mentioned, we are just using now, um, we, we just have to find the communication between the different objects. So totally right, nothing to add. And I think again that, but that's, this needs to be highlighted that we don't need to reinvent something new because it's a already updated technology. It's a it's a mature technology we are using, um, and of course the only thing which was maybe a bit challenging in the beginning is that the ISO standard is um, referencing to a lot of other standards. So if you want to implement ISO 15108, you need to analyze a lot of additional standards, which is of course a bit more complicated. Um, and therefore, I think it's worth to mentioning the so-called DKE uh, application guideline, which is already predefining some specific processes, some specific structures. Um, this is so far defined um, by the DKE, a German association. Um, so, so far, it's not yet any kind of, of official standard, so to say. But uh, most companies, uh, even companies from outside of Germany, who have now implemented ISO 15108, also implementing this TKE application guideline to really um, have a proper processes and, and, and structures in place. Yeah. So what? Maybe one more thing to add. I mean, we're not only considering in the ISO part the way we are exchanging um, the certificates, whether it's for TLS or for plug and charge use cases, but we have also defined messages for installation an update of certificates. I mean, certificates may expire, or uh, if you look at business cases, contract certificates. Yeah, If you have a contract certificate with your energy uh, provider, you might switch, uh, like to switch to a different uh, energy provider that uh, uh, requires that you then exchange your contract uh, certificate. So all these measures, the message set to do that is already part of um, the ISO protocol. So this is all uh, possible um, based on the um, ISO messages that are available today. So that's nothing about the 20 document that's already uh, impl uh, implemented and uh, standardized with the dash two uh, document. Good. I have a question for Christian, maybe. Um, so it was a lot in the news last weekend, and, and it popped up here on the in the chat. What specifically allowed non-Tesla vehicles to charge on the supercharger network this weekend? Um, yeah, it was by mistake. Uh, but yeah, um, <laughs> as we know, um, Tesla is using a kind of similar approach uh, to enable. Uh, a charging station between a Tesla EV car and a Tesla charging station. So they're also using, maybe based on a, on a, on a pre-standard, uh, some kind of plug and charge use case. 
somehow, for whatever reason, nobody knows, uh, this didn't work properly over the weekend. So as uh, Tesla is also using CCS now in Europe, they are obliged to install charging stations based on CCS because that's the European standard for fast charging. Also, car models from other car manufacturers were able to use uh, CCS charging station from Tesla. Um, the assumption is they have shut this plug and charge feature off for whatever reason. I think it was a coincidence or a bug, um, but unfortunately, they shut it on again. So since Sunday afternoon, it's not possible anymore. But I think that would be exactly the way to, to how the EV future should look like that every charging station can be used by every um, car model uh, based on a fair price, of course. Um, and uh, let's let's work all jointly on this so that it's not that relevant if the op charging stations operated by a green, blue, red, or yellow company just works and it gives you exactly the recharge you need to get at this moment. And in best case, plug and charge is implemented so that it's even more uh, seamless from a customer perspective. You just need to plug in and everything is working. Yeah, I think um, we, we have to keep the focus uh, indeed on the user convenience. Um, and I think maybe we can conclude from here this, um, this webinar. Um, we, we have a strong standardization, uh, well set out um, the, the ISO norm um, in, for a long time uh, future. But uh, user convenience is a key uh, for in the charging experience. Um, customer focus is indeed. Um, crucial to guarantee the future of the electric mobility market. So thank you for the speakers um, from today. Um, thank you, Christian, Jens, Jörg, and Dirk. If you have more questions, um, more technical questions, maybe um, please address them directly to our speakers. They're certainly pleased to help you further on, yes. on the aspects of, of this material. Um, Thank you very much. I thank you also, Charin, for organizing this webinar of today. Um, looking forward to the next ones. Um, we have next week um, also insights on bidirectional charging, the opportunities and visionary ideas. Um, really looking forward to that because there is also a hot topic um, in the market. Thank you all. Have a nice day.